Let's open our Bibles and stand together for the reading of God's Word. Please find Romans chapter number 12. Chapter 12 in the book of Romans. We're going to look at verse 7 and jump right on into the lesson as we desire tonight to unwrap the spiritual gift of server. In Romans chapter 12, verse 7, the Bible says, Or ministry, let us wait on our ministering, or he that teacheth on teaching. I guess we would take verse 6 with it to give it some context and so the thought will develop. In verse 6, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophesy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith, or ministry, let us wait on our ministry, or he that teacheth on teaching, and it goes on. Father, help me tonight to effectively unwrap this gift and, and present it. We'll look in the box as it were, pull it out, take a look at it, and understand it, uh, anticipating, Lord, the time in our series where we will pause a little while and reflect on how these gifts interact with each other and what, they, what it all means and all that. So, Father, help us tonight to look and see what you want to show us about this precious gift, the gift of serving. In Jesus' name, I'm asking you for that. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Do you have the gift of serving? So this is lesson three, then, unwrapping the gift of server. The text is Romans chapter 12, verse 7, part A. The text, the course text, covers chapter 7, pages 40 to 42. And we're looking at charts or your worksheets, number 17 and 18. And they are found on pages 72 and 73 in your course text. If you don't have that, uh, let, me, let me know after services and I'll tell you how to get it. So let's go ahead and get started. Tonight we're going to unwrap the spiritual gift of server. And we are going to proceed as follows. First, after a brief introduction, we're going to talk about what is the gift of serving. Help you understand what it is. And we're going to do that in three ways. One, we're going to define the gift. Then we're going to understand the word that's translated minister here. And then we're going to go over some basic Bible truths regarding serving that are applicable not only to servers, but of course to all of us. Then we're going to move to characteristics common to the servers. And finally, misunderstandings of the servers. And that'll be your quiz, as it were, or your test, whatever you want to call it, your survey of characteristics, whereby you can get some idea uh, whether or not you might have this particular gift. And then we're going to wrap it all up with a conclusion, looking at guidelines to how to effectively express this gift in the body of Christ. And if I have time... Uh, we're going to review some interesting and important things right there. Let's go ahead and get on with it. The server. Now, everybody wants to be the server just because of how handsome this guy is, right? No, of course not, but anyway. <laughs> Introduction. Some regard serving as an inferior gift, but they are wrong. The fact is, Jesus dignified and exalted serving by becoming a servant. Open your Bible to Philippians chapter 2. And let's read this together. Let me read quietly as I go over it. It's on the screen as well if you didn't happen to bring your Bible. Philippians chapter 2 verse 5, the Bible says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a, and here's the word, servant. And was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. So the Lord Jesus Christ exalted this role of servant by becoming one. Verse 11 goes on to say, Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, this little cross you see right here, it happens to be a symbol of persecuted saints. You might have seen that Facebook thing going around of, uh, of a jihadist beheading a little child because he would not denounce Jesus Christ. I didn't have a chance to go into it, look at that closely enough to be confident that that's for real, not just something somebody photoshopped or whatever. But we know that kind of thing goes on, don't we? So I thought we'd take just a moment to think about that and... Let's remember them in our prayers. Our culture does not value servantship, although it does highly value service. 
A, you ever go to a restaurant and you complain about the service? <sighs> yeah, I mean, we, we, we expect service. But when it comes to us being a servant, we're a little bit not so hot on that, you know. And this is because the natural man is proud and self-centered. We just have to admit that. We as Christians, I hope, have grown some in death to self, that we've come much out of that kind of thing. But uh, even, even I get irritated with bad service at a restaurant, right? And, and think myself worthy and deserving of better. And we all tend to have that, that attitude. But the Bible says this. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Philippians 2, verse 3. You never know what the guy waiting at your table has been through that day. Right? So cool your jets, calm down. Let's esteem each better than ourselves. All right? Amen. And I'm preaching to myself here. Even though I got my hands like this. Usually when preachers are pointing fingers, they do it this way. Where you got three pointing back at you? Not me. I preach like this. <laughs> Jesus honors servantship above leadership. It's important to keep that in mind. And he does that consistently. So what is the gift of serving? Well, let's talk about it. It is the spirit-given capacity and desire to serve God by rendering practical help in both physical and spiritual matters. The server is the person who meets the practical needs of his fellow Christians and the church. Now that's a quote from Larry Gilbert, who worked with Elmer Towns, producing all kinds of material and spiritual gifts. They've got a lot of good things to say, and the material is excellent. And that's in Team Ministry Workbook, page number eight. They spent a lot of time looking at this and thinking about it. That's not a biblical definition, but when I read the definition, I thought it touches, I think, all of the bases, as we'll see while we, when we proceed here. The word translated ministers and ministry is the Greek word diakonia, and unless you can say that, you can't pass your test and, and graduate from this class, which means you'll have to repeat it over and over and over and over. Like those movies, you know, where you just get into a loop and never mind. <laughs> all right. The, the point is, you don't need to know that, but... It's interesting because there are a couple of other Greek words, Greek words that are also translated serving or minister and so on. This word is, has some special connotations to it that we'll look at. And one of them is this. It means to be an attendant. Right? Have you ever gone somewhere where they have attendants? What's their job? Well, to give you their attention. To give attention to your needs. To give attention to you. So if you come into a place, you have an attendant there, <clears throat> perhaps to show you around, to answer questions, whatever, an attendant. To run on an errand, to run down a task, to take care of something, to run errands, to wait on the needs of others. Now when we say wait on them, that doesn't mean we stand there and wait while they have a need. Obviously. It means that we serve them. We serve that need. We wait on it with attention and take care of things as needs arise. That's what a waiter does. A waiter comes by your table and pays attention to what's going on on that table. If she sees your water low, she grabs uh, the thing and fills your water. If she sees your coffee low, she'll ask you, would you like some more coffee? She's waiting on your table or he is waiting on your table. There are four English words that are used to translate this word, diakonia. The first is ministry or ministering. It's Romans 12, 7. The next is serving. Luke 10, 40. Administration is used in 2 Corinthians 9, 12. And then finally, the word relief is used in Acts eleven twenty nine. 29. Now, we're going to look at each of these again. So if you're completing the blanks in your notes, have no fear. You're going to get a chance to see all that again and get your blanks filled in. Let's look at ministry or ministering. Romans 12, verse number 7. You know, in truth, this gift should be called the gift of ministry. That's actually the word that's used in Romans 12, verse number 7. There is a reason, however, that we don't use that word when we're trying to teach this. And that reason is it avoids confusion because 
Interestingly, and this is a very important thing to understand about this particular gift. The truth is, the Bible uses the word minister or servant to identify all leadership offices in the church. All leadership offices are called ministers. So we use the word minister, right? You refer to me sometimes as he's my minister. Well, in Baptist churches, we don't do that a whole lot. But, you know, it is something, it's a word that we use and we're accustomed to be, it being used to, to identify the pastor or somebody uh, in an official office in the church. And so in order to avoid had that confusion, we use the word server when we're talking about the gift instead of the word minister, but they mean the same thing. These words mean exactly the same thing, and it is instructive that Jesus Christ refers to, for example, the Apostle Paul as a minister. So bishops and deacons and, and others who serve in leadership capacity in the church are servants. I'll appreciate uh, Dr. Paul Chapel and his leadership conference because he emphasizes this point it's servant leadership servant leadership he talks about servant leaders serving then let's look at that word uh, luke chapter 10 verse number 40 you know martha is a perfect example of the server that might not be something you feel very complimented by if you happen to be a server because martha got fussed at a little bit We'll be looking at her story a little bit more as we go along in the lesson tonight. But this much, remember, Martha was busy, busy, busy. She was washing the dishes or she was sweeping up the crumbs from the table or clearing off the table. And, and she was busy doing those things after they ate. Everyone else was sitting down listening to Jesus teach. And Mary was among them sitting there and listening to Jesus teach. But Martha, she had a very old-fashioned idea about what women should be doing. And she figured that women ought to be in there with her cleaning the kitchen. And so she complained to Jesus. She said, Master, can you not see? And I'm ad living here somewhat, but I'm not outside the story here. Uh, can you not see that I'm busy, busy, and Mary's just sitting there doing nothing? Why don't you have her come help me? And then Jesus says, Martha, Martha, you are cumbered about with much. What's the word? You don't know the word these days? Serving. You are cumbered about with much serving. She was a server. She had a servant motivation, no doubt. And that was her motivation. Do you understand, though, that Jesus didn't call her from the kitchen? I don't know if you ever thought about that or not. Jesus never said, said to Martha, Martha, you should not be in the kitchen. You should be sitting here next to Mary. No, Jesus had Martha doing exactly what Martha was gifted to do. She didn't get rebuked because she was serving. She got rebuked because she was complaining. That's where the rebuke comes in. And uh, so anyway, we'll look at this some more later on. The word server conveys the idea of rendering service to someone, whether it is meeting a particular need or offering assistance to someone who's trying to get something done. This is an interesting word that's used to translate diakonia, or the same word that's translated ministry in our text, Romans 12, verse 7. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 12, Paul referred to his work of organizing an offering that was to be presented to suffering saints in Jerusalem. He called it an administration. It's an interesting, it's an interesting word. It translates the same word translated server and minister or diakonia. Servers participate in an organized effort to accomplish a goal. They, they tend to like be at their best in that role. Uh, in a group where tasks are organized and delegated out, uh, the server's in their environment. And they can take hold of this task or that task and run it down and get it done. And they like being part of a team and doing something like that. So uh, this is where this word administration comes in. Uh, sometimes this causes the server to be mistaken for an administrator because they like organization and they work well in a def well-defined uh, situation. 
And so sometimes people mistake them for administrators and then promote them to a place in their organization where they no longer are comfortable. And it's not because they can't or don't know how, it's they don't like it. <laughs> Servers typically don't like that role. They're more comfortable in another role. And you'll understand better why in a moment. This is an important thing about these motivations to understand. We're not talking about the idea that, well, servers, they just can't be good leaders uh, of organizations because, you know, they're just a little bit lower on the totem pole. of No, that's not what it is at all. A lot of people motivated with the gift of serving can do very well in administration or in any other capacity. There are many very, very effective pastors who are motivated with the gift of serving. The difference is in the motivation. Such pastors don't enjoy administrating. They do it because they have to do it, but they don't enjoy it, you see. They like better, and so therefore they organize a little differently and often delegate out things and stuff like this. We'll get into this some more when we get into how these gifts interact with one another, but I want to disabuse you of a misnomer. Leadership isn't a higher level than servantship. We, we hopefully established that right in the introduction. But it's such an ingrained concept, it's hard to get across to people. People who have the gift of servant, of servant are not given the gift because they're just a little bit dumber than the guys who get the gift of leading. This is what I'm trying to get across. People who get the gift of serving are not given the gift of serving because they're just, you know, uh, not quite with it. When it and that's not it. They're given the gift of serving because God wants some servings going on. He wants that happening. And so he motivates people in that way. When I get to the conclusion here and talk about this expression of the motivation of Christ, something I've touched on before and hopefully we'll elaborate on a little bit tonight, you'll appreciate my point right now even more. Here's another word. The fourth word that's used to translate diakonia is this word relief. And it's found in Acts chapter 11, verse 29. It's the only place where diakonia is translated, or trans, yeah, translated relief. It's the only place you find it. It is a similar case to Paul's effort to raise an offering to relieve suffering saints. Agabus gave a prophecy of a coming famine. The church responded to the prophecy by organizing to prepare relief for those who would suffer under the burden of the famine. And so it's like Paul getting the offering together, administration, and relief are aspects of this gift of serving. And so it's important to understand use of the word relief for the gift of serving speaks to the heart of this motivation gift. A server is motivated by a desire to render service that will relieve a burden from those served. All right, when a server is motivated, activated, Hopefully by going through this, you're getting, you're getting a better and better idea of what it, what it is to have a motivation gift. It's what, what activates you, what turns you on, if you will, what gets you going, what motivates you. And so when a server sees something that needs to be done, they get activated. That gift activates and they respond What's activating the gift is the perception that there's something that needs to be done that will relieve the need for it to be done. It's almost like they see something that needs to be done and immediately a burden gets on them that needs to get relieved. And they move to get it taken care of. That doesn't mean, of course, they don't have an eye on the relief ministered to those who are carrying the burden and so on as well. All right. More as we move along, relief is related to the gift of helps mentioned in 1 Corinthians 12, 28. That verse says, and God hath set some in the church. And then he gives a, an order. He says, first, apostles. Secondarily, prophets. Thirdly, teachers. After that, miracles. Then, gifts of healings, helps, governments, diversities of tongues. Now, we're going to examine this hierarchy 
of spiritual gifts very closely later on. But this word helps and the word relief connect the server to that place in the hierarchy of gifts as they minister to the body. <clears throat> Basic Bible truths regarding serving. I got to fix these transitions to go a little more quickly. All right, the basic Bible truths regarding serving. Now, you've got some blanks to fill in, so here we go. Ready? Every Christian is a servant. Romans eleven thirteen. Oh, by the way, did you not receive your sheet? I am sorry. They're available. And if you need one, raise your hand and you'll get it. All right. Sorry about that. All of you who subscribed to this series received an email today. And the idea is, if you can, print it. And just bring it with you. But if your printer doesn't work, or you just would rather use our ink than your own, then you're not a server. But go ahead. <laughs> or a giver, for that matter. <laughs> okay. But anyway, let's make sure you get that. I'm sorry. I thought you had those. Guys, in the future, when those are handed to you, just go ahead and distribute them, okay? Go ahead and get them out there. Right after you give the offering. How's that? Let's do it that way. In the future, if you have those things, as soon as the offer is received and you get back there, then, then you come back with those and just make sure everybody has them. Amen. All right. So every Christian is a servant. Romans 11, 13, 12, 11, Hebrews 9, 14. Um, the Apostle Paul calls himself a minister or a servant, his office. The word office in Romans eleven thirteen 13 actually translates this word minister. Translate this word diakonia. In Romans 12, verse number 11. Let's take a look at that real quick. Romans 12, 11. Give you a chance also to kind of catch up. Not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. So all of us are exhorted to serve the Lord. We're all servants. Hebrews 9, 14, that whole passage is really interesting because what it says there is that Jesus Christ died on the cross, shed his blood for atonement for us, in order that all of us might serve the Lord. That's why he died, died on the cross, so that we could serve the Lord. <clears throat> all right, Jesus regarded servantship as prerequisite to leadership. Mark chapter 9, verse 35, And he sat down and called the twelve, and saith unto them, If any man desire to be first, the same shall be last of all, and servant of all. Now, he's not saying this. If you desire to be first, then I'm going to punish you by making you last of all. That's not what he's saying. What he's saying is the path to leadership is servantship. If I can use that word, servantship. I don't find it in the dictionary, but it's okay. If we've got leadership, we can have servantship. All right? So the path to leadership is servantship. That's what Jesus is saying. If anybody wants to be a leader, he needs to start here by learning how to be a good servant. So this gift is like foundational to every other thing that you do. We often think of the teaching gift as the foundation gift, and it is. And we'll talk about that when we introduce or unwrap the gift of teaching next week. So I don't want to take anything from that. That's very true. But in terms of Attitude for service, in terms of attitude of uh, ministry and working for the Lord and all that. The servant is the foundation. Service. It's all the, we even call our worship services services. Because we're ministering or serving the Lord and his people. So this word Serving and service is very foundational to everything that we do for the Lord. He elevated the role of servantship, as we already mentioned. In Matthew 20, verses 26 to 28, I think I have that verse written out for us here because it's such an important one. You might want to open your Bible and look at it with me. Jesus said, But it shall not be so among you, but whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. This is the mistake a lot of people make. They think a leadership position is a position where you're ministered to. 
Now, a leadership position is a greater opportunity for ministering to others. So leadership is about ministering to others, not being ministered unto. So keep that in mind. That's the way Jesus organized it. Jesus made it clear, no one can effectively lead who will not become a servant. Now, there's a a lot of practical wisdom in that. Who here likes to follow somebody who's all about, follow me, do what I say, and won't do it himself. Nobody. Nobody. Nobody likes to follow some guy that say, hey, y'all, go over and do that. But they don't mind following somebody who's out there doing that and saying, come on. Right? It's, it's very important to understand that. Uh, somebody said, you know, leadership is like a string set on a table. If you push the string, what happens? It just bunches up. But if you grab the other end and you pull the string, what happens? All the string follows. And you actually get somewhere. Amen? So it's important to understand that basic principle. In order to be an effective leader, you've got to first understand what it means to be a servant. In fact, we call those who serve as leaders in the church, well, we call them our ministers, something I mentioned earlier. Paul called himself a minister in Romans 15, 16, these verses. You should have them written down in your notes. If not, they're in your text. But Paul called himself a minister. Leaders must have the spirit of a servant before they can be used by the spirit as a leader. That's how fundamental and foundational this gift is. All service, this is number four now, all service rendered to others must be as unto God and not as unto men. Matthew 6, 24 says, No man can serve two masters. He says, you'll hate the one and hold to the other or else you'll and so on. You cannot serve God and mammon. You can't get divided that way. If you're going to be a servant, you need to ultimately be serving the Lord. That's the idea here. See, what our service is rendered ultimately to God and not to man. The Bible says, servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. All right, let's go ahead and look at the ten characteristics of the server. You ready? It's on the flip side of your page or page number two. Ten characteristics common to those with the gift of server. Now, as I go over these, what you should do is think about whether or not this describes you. Now, don't make this mistake. Everybody can relate to all of these sometimes. The ability to recall specific likes and dislikes of people. There are times when I remember somebody's specific like or dislike. That does happen. But I wouldn't check this because that's not characteristic of me. This is not the kind of thing other people have noticed about me. Nobody's ever said, wow, that's amazing. You remember that I like cream in my coffee after five years and we haven't seen each other? Nobody's ever said that to me. Nobody ever will. Because it's not the kind of thing I'm tuned into. All right? I'm I'm motivated differently. But there are people, and of course that might have been an exaggeration, five years, you know. But there are people who are like that. They just have a knack for remembering, amazingly remembering details. I visited this family, the Blags, You know, I stayed with them a year or two, or was it three years ago? I don't even remember. I can't even remember that, much less, you know, what somebody likes in their coffee. But uh, two or three years ago, I stayed in their home, and and they learned some things about the. And they're very good about this. And so I stayed in their home again when I was speaking for Brother Benefield, and I was just astounded. She remembered that I I like to have this, and I like that, and this, yeah, all these things. It was really weird. Maybe feel a little bit uncomfortable, you know. You keep in a diary somewhere and writing this stuff down. How are you doing this? And of course, I'm being facetious. It's a gift. She's got this gift of server. And so she's tuned into people in that way. And she remembers these things. So if it's something somebody would say about you, or it's something that is just characteristic, it's like, yeah, that's me, then check mark it. If it's something you think, yeah, you know, every now and then, then don't check it. Okay. The ability to recall likes. Specific likes and dislikes of people. 
The next one, the alertness to detect and meet practical needs, especially enjoys physical projects. So, there's number two. Now, number three. The motivation to meet needs as quickly as possible. Number four. The willingness to use personal funds to avoid delays. Now, this is different than the giver. The giver is motivated, comes at it from a different angle, as we'll see when we look at this later. What I'm describing here is a situation where you're on a church project and you're involved and they're digging a ditch and a shovel breaks and, and you need a shovel. Your first reaction isn't to go buy a shovel. Your first reaction is go find a shovel. But you can't find a shovel. And then you ask them, well, we need a shovel. And they tell you, well, you've got to fill out a requisition form. And then after the requisition form gets approved by the pastor and four deacons. And then, you know, the red tape type thing. And then you go, oh, well, not, forget it. I'll just go buy one. All right. That's different from the giver. Now, when we go back to the giver, I'll show you. But I want to make sure you differentiate that because I'll have a bunch of givers checking this. But that's a different motivation here. All right. So, but the server is somebody willing to use personal funds to avoid delays. Number five, the desire to sense sincere appreciation and the ability to detect insincerity. If you're just saying, oh, yeah, oh, I really like you, whatever, they, they have a, a knack for radaring in on that. So, all right, they can know when we're being sincere or not sincere. Another interesting thing about givers, I mean, giver, oops, s servers. Another interesting thing about servers is they like what they did to be appreciated. As much, if not more, than them to be appreciated. You know, it's not, it's not all about, oh, what a wonderful person you are. That, for many servers, would be kind of like, huh? But if you say, if you really focus, you did this, you did this well, this is great, this really helped. And then that's something that the server is looking for. Physical stamina to fulfill needs with disregard for weariness. These are your energizer bunnies. What happens with the server is the need or the task sets loose the adrenaline. All right? So there's something that needs to be done, and that gets their motor going. From others of us, that turns the motor off. So we're just different. You know, we're wired differently. But the server, it gets a lot of extra energy just from the fact that they're motivated to deal with something that needs to be dealt with. Obviously, servers can get sick, and if they're sick, that's going to be a problem. I'm talking about if you're just basically healthy. The desire to complete a job with evidence of unexpected extra service. Yeah, the server likes to go the extra mile. The server likes it if they do a job and someone notices Oh, wow, you took that to the next level. Servers like that. They like, they like people to notice that because they like to do that. They enjoy it. They're motivated that way. An, an involvement in a variety of activities with the inability to say no. Now, servers have a hard time with this. If there's a need, you can convince them that it's a legitimate need. They want to go meet it. They want to go address it. They want to get involved. So they have a tendency to spread themselves too thin. Now, some people have an inability to say no for other reasons. If you have an inability to say no, because I, I can't get into it right now, uh, we will later. So I'm going to stop right there. I want to try to get done on time. <laughs> okay, here we go. A greater enjoyment of short-range goals with frustration over long-range goals. Servers like a job they can start and end in a shorter period of time and get it done. They don't like a job that requires on and on and on and on and on and on and on. It gets them a little bit fatigued emotionally. A, a frustration when limitations of time are attached to a job. So there's a little bit of a conundrum here. On one side, the server likes to have all the time they need to get the job done the way they like to get it done with extra service and all that. On the other hand, they don't like a job that requires just goes on and on and on and on. It never seems to end. It never seems to be a place where you're done. They have, they have frustration with stuff like that. <clears throat> Others of us live with that. Twelve ways the server is often misunderstood. All right? 
12 ways the server is misunderstood. Let's look at them. I'll try to go a little bit more quickly. Quickness in meeting needs may appear as being pushy. So if you have people react to you negatively, like, get, get, do it, leave me alone. If you get that going on a lot, you're probably a server. <laughs> okay. Avoidance of red tape might result in excluding others from jobs. Like the illustration of the shovel. Well, that was facetious. We don't have that kind of complication involved. But to use that as an example, the server in that case cut off a lot of people. Cut off the treasurer, cut off the pastor, cut off this guy, that guy. Circumvented a whole, a whole line of other people who've been tasked to be a part of what this job is all about. And they went and just cut the legs out from all under them. That's frustrating to people. People react to that. They get annoyed. So this happens with servers. They'll do that. Their disregard for personal needs might extend to their own family. And it does often. Servers, you know, the family feels like you care more about the guy down the street that needs you, help, needs you to help him move than you do our own backyard. Because the server's motivated that way. All right? Eagerness in serving might prompt suspicion of self-advancement. And by the way, when I say misunderstandings, the family that reacts to a husband or a wife or whatever that has this serving gift is misunderstanding what's going on when they react that way. Now, that server needs to be sat down and helped to understand that there are some things right here that need to be done. I mean, that needs to happen. But to get angry or to feel like you love them more than us, no, you, you misunderstand. That isn't what it's about. It's a misunderstanding. You're not understanding that gift. Eagerness in serving might prompt suspicion of self-advancement. The guy's ready to take on any task that comes up. The boss says he needs this, and boom, he's on it, he's on it, he's on it, he's on it. And everybody else looking at me, ah, uh, brown noser. They don't understand. That's not at all where it's coming from. That guy or that gal is just motivated that way. It's what they like to do. It's how they're wired. They might react to others who do not detect and meet needs, like Martha reacted to Mary. This is where I was going to spend a little more time with Martha, but I'm running out of time, so we're not going to. I gave her enough time earlier. So we're going to move right on. Insistence on serving might appear to be rejection of being served. You know, sometimes the, the server is oriented and organized about serving somebody else. And when you try to help them, say, no, just sit down and you take it easy. They get frustrated. They don't like it. It's not helping me. I want to get up and do. See, but you think you're helping them. Oh, you don't have to do anything. What you're doing is you're saying your gift doesn't matter here. You don't realize you're saying that, but that's what's happening. So we have to be careful about those sorts of things. And that's another reason this is helpful to the whole church body. Desire to sense sincere appreciation can result in them being easily hurt. Or at least it looks like they're being easily hurt. Quickness in meeting needs might interfere with spiritual lessons God is trying to teach other people. Obviously, right? If somebody's going through something, they have a need, and you jump in there and address that need, could be God was using that need to motivate them to do something in their own life that they need to do. So it's important for the server to pray. And this goes to the whole thing over all these gifts. You need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. There's the bottom line with regard to all these misunderstandings especially. Meeting practical needs might be judged as a lack of interest in spiritual matters. Once again, here's Martha. What, what do you think of Martha? Most of you think Martha is not as spiritual as Mary. You're wrong. No, Martha was doing her gift. Jesus didn't say to the group, where's Martha? Well, there she is again. No, she was doing what he expected she'd be doing. She got in trouble when she stepped out of line and started badgering Jesus about somebody else. That's when she got herself in trouble. Their stamina might be inter interpreted as insensitivity or impatience with others. I mentioned Ann Hunter. Was it, did I mention that here? I, okay. Ann Hunter had the gift of serving. And oh my soul, that woman was like an energizer bunny. And it was go, 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 go. And if you were in the kitchen with her, it's like look out. All right. Now, not all servers are exactly the same. That's another important thing we'll get into later on. But most servers have a lot of energy. 
they get they get the adrenaline gets going when there's a thing when there's a thing to get done. That's how they get activated. So look out. Here they come. All right. They can be real tired, but the adrenaline gets them going because they're, you know, they want to get this done. The inability to avoid others' needs might result in sidetracking from the employer's directions. That's a problem for me as an administrator at Baptist Christian Schools. I had some on the staff that were servant type people, servers, uh, motivated as a server. And consequently, I had to watch that because I'd give them a job to do. And then on their way out the door to do the job, somebody will say there's a need for this. And I walk out there and this guy's over there helping somebody with a with a printer. Or with a copy machine or doing something else. And I walk out there and what are you doing? Well, I'm going to help them. No, I, I want you over here doing that. If I have to, I'll call somebody in to do this. I need you to go do that. You know what I mean? So sometimes servers can, can frustrate you because, well, they're going to respond to whatever needs to be done as they're going about their business. So servers need to be careful that they stay focused on the tasks that they've been given. Guidelines for effective expression of a gift. Serve within the boundaries and guidelines, the purposes and objectives that are immediately in your field of ministry. So, in other words, if you've been given a job and it's defined as being this, then make sure you stay within the confinements of that definition and keep your activity focused on that. Take some discipline to do that because it's hard for you if you're a server because you just want to help. Won't take but a minute. No, just, just, just two minutes. I'll get this done. And you'll be doing that all day, and you add up all those two minutes sidetracks, and you've wasted three or four hours of your employer's time. So you want to be careful about that. Avoid the temptation to run after every task that presents itself. It's very easy to do. Stay focused on your task. Get that done first. Become aware of how you might be misunderstood and avoid behavior that tends to trigger those reactions. So it's helpful to understand, you know, what your motivation is and how you might be misunderstood. Learn what Jesus taught regarding concern over what other disciples should be doing. That seems to be a consistent problem with servers. They get frustrated with other people who don't see what needs to get done. And it bothers them. And they get all focused on that. Remember Peter turns about, sees the disciple whom Jesus loved following. And Jesus ask, uh, Peter asks Jesus, and what shall this man do? And Jesus' classic answer is, that's none of your business, or something like that. It didn't quite go that way, but pretty close. He says, what if I, uh, he says, if, uh, excuse, Jesus saith unto him, if I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Follow thou me. You stay focused I mean, looking unto Jesus, you stay focused on Jesus and don't get your eyes off on what this guy's doing or not doing, what this guy's doing or not doing, what this guy's doing or not doing. That will definitely not work for you. All right, it won't help you. If you answered yes to 85% or more of the characteristics and misunderstandings, you're very likely candidate for the gift of server. That doesn't mean you are. It doesn't mean, oh, there it is, you found your gift. We're not done yet. Some of you, bless your hearts, you're going to think you're everything. Okay, and I'll tell you what that means you are when we get over there. Okay, because that, that suggests something about which gift you probably have if you have a tendency to find yourself in everything. But anyway, that pretty well takes care of it. I was going to go into um, uh, a thing about what it means to have, a, have any of these gifts, and I'll wrap it up very, very short, very short. We are baptized by the Spirit into Christ. That body seated on the right hand of the throne of God. In that body, we are united, and Jesus is motivated to serve. And his motivations are perfect and complete, and they are expressed in these seven motivations. He gives each of those who are in him, one of those, that he sends through you to manifest in the body of Christ the church, and through the church to the world. So whatever your gift is. If you're a server, you got a big one. Jesus came to serve. That was his main thing. He exalts that role. So if you have the gift of serving, you've got a good one. And I have noticed uh, over the years, people who find themselves with this motivation actually tend to go, oh, no, I understand. 
and they have satisfaction in it. In fact, I'll guarantee you, when you learn what your spiritual gift is, which of the perfections of Jesus' motivation, which of them you are assigned to manifest in the church, when you find out which one it is, that's how you bring Jesus into the fellowship. Amen? That's how you bring him and his influence into the fellowship of the Lord's churches. So that's awesome. It's great. Now you have this gift. The next time you're doing it, you're bringing Jesus into that thing. Amen? Let's stand together, please. Once again, these are teaching sessions, so they don't lend themselves real well to a, you know, an invitation where we're all breaking our hearts before the Lord, but we should humble ourselves before the Lord and appreciate, appreciate this great truth. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. You go around my reputation, no, no reputation. Took upon him the form of a servant and humbled himself in fashion as a man. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And does not the Bible say to all of us, if any man come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Repeatedly, Jesus said, to be my disciple, it starts by taking up the cross, dying to self, putting self aside, and watching what Jesus Christ will do with your life. All right, that's the invitation. Let's respond to the Lord Jesus Christ. In whatever way he spoke to you, if he spoke to you about this, that, or the other thing, you, you speak with him about it now. Respond to the Lord.